cardboard ruins. Ruins made of cardboard. The ruins that came with the 40k second edition box set. Can I remake these? I don't mean make them out of cardboard again, I mean make them a bit more 3D. In this video, I will do my best to accomplish that goal. If you own the starter set for Warhammer 40k 2nd edition, you will also have owned these cardboard ruins. If the Space Marines, Orcs, Gretchen, and let's not forget the cardboard Dreadnought, are the stars of the 2nd edition show, then for many of us, these cardboard ruins made up the stage on which the show was performed. So they were no less important. Indeed, if the photos on the sides of the box and in the rulebook invoked in us emotion, it was the envy for these gorgeous vistas created by the studio team. Rocky outcrops, industrial complexes, and battlefield bunkers. All handmade by the looks of it, since official Citadel terrain was few and far between at the time. I'm sure we have all settled for piles of books and pepper pots as stand-in terrain when we started out. Charming times, but the cardboard ruins given in this set were a useful halfway point between kitchen table hammer and studio quality tables, and these were essential if you wanted to accurately play out the Armageddon missions that came with the set. In the starter set for Warhammer 40k 2nd edition, you were blessed with 20 cardboard ruins of various shapes and sizes. Two of these were special, in that they had a first floor, a raised area to place your precious heavy weapons. I always wanted these on the battlefield for that very reason. The rulebook had some very brief instructions of how to build them, and you were encouraged to make use of the corner pieces to glue them in place to increase the lifespan and stability of these terrain pieces. It is only now I realise that these corner pieces should have been scored and folded before gluing them on the insides of the ruins. Eleven-year-old me, instead, kept them flat and stuck them to the ruins with super glue, like an absolute boss man. I suppose the descriptor, bull in a china shop, used on me by my mother, was well founded. These ruins had many years of play, but sadly in 2014 I had a massive purge of hobby stuff and threw the lot in the bin. If only I had known, but never mind, an eBay purchase granted me this set. The only thing is, I want to make them better. Now to some extent, this project has been inspired by the wonderful Ed of Minisodes, who made his ruins look awesome by mounting them on bases and such. However, I want to do something different. I want to remake them from crafting materials I own. I know STL files exist for these, but I don't currently own a 3D printer, and Mrs. Miniscape has strongly dissuaded me from obtaining one. Don't you think you've got enough plastic? Well, quite. So I'm going to craft them, and the main material I'm going to use is these placemats. Don't you dare. And the main material I'm going to use is these old placemats Mrs. Miniscape forgot about. Well, she was going to throw them away, but you don't dispose of something like this, oh no. And while they are not the easiest material to work with, the combination of MDF and cork combines rigidity and pleasing texture. Oh man, that just rolled right off the tongue. Before I get to work, I need a template. So I used my ancient flatbed scanner to scan the cardboard ruins I currently own. Then I printed them black and white, possibly an unnecessary step, but it allowed me to deface the templates while preserving the precious 90s cardboard originals. I used a sharp blade to cut out the template of choice and then drew around the template onto the cork side of the old placemat. The other side still had a glossy coating, but these were particularly cheap mats, so it peels off easily. And here's the not so great bit. Due to my lack of power tools, I need to use all manner of saws and knives to extract the shape from the mat. So I will spare you the tedium of watching me hack at it and allow the power of editing to do its thing. Now this terrain piece was designed to fold in the middle, but I decided to make it a straight wall for the first effort. Now the idea is to make this more 3D than the original. So I take some 1mm cardstock 
and use the template to cut out a strip that will be, what, the skirting boards? I don't know the architectural terms and it's not something I'm going to research. Anyway, it goes at the bottom of the piece to give it a more sticky outiness. The original ruins had a brickwork pattern on them, and the presence of the cork allows me to engrave this pattern into the piece. I use this sculpting tool to gouge out areas, leaving the impression of bricks on the wall. With that part done, I paint some PVA glue onto the cork and stick down the card strip I cut out earlier. In addition, I stick down some other small strips to represent the columns. I realise I could have made these from dowel or something else cylindrical, but I might get more experimental later on. Next, I cut out parts of the template and stick it onto my cardstock. This allows me to cut out the desired shapes more accurately. Again, I PVA these onto the cork. For the base, I use another piece of placemat and round off the corners with a craft knife. There's no template for this, I just eyeball it, cutting to size an appropriate piece so there's a centimetre or two gap around where the wall will stand. A large dollop of PVA glue was used to stick the wall to the base, along with some small supports which I made from offcuts from earlier. Always save your offcuts, people. Some extra PVA is applied to the base, and of course, I throw on some Lancashire sand. Now while that's drying, let's make another. This is the same as the prototype I made before I started this project. It is an interesting broken window which I enjoy making a little bit more 3D than the original cardboard ruin. Again I take a printed template and cut this out carefully with my craft knife. Again this is outlined on some cork placemat and hacked apart off camera so you don't mock me. For this one, I decided I wanted it to be L shaped, so it was at this stage I made that cut and another one which was the product of my crazed chopping frenzy. Next, I mark on where the brickwork will be before again gouging out the excess cork with my tool. For the window, I take some 5mm foam core and cut it to shape with another template I made. If the shape isn't spot on then I didn't lose any sleep. It was a ruin after all. Next I cut apart the window template so I made some sort of raised components from the window including this ring section, and the middle with holes I made using a single hole punch. And then I simply glued these parts onto foam core. I thought about doing this process on both sides of the foam core. That, that's it, that's the end of the story. What I, I thought about it, I didn't take any action on the thought. Anyway, after gouging some foam from the middle of the foam core, I slotted it onto the cork placemat like so, gluing it with PVA. Now it was time to base it. Since it was an L shape, I cut a 45 degree wedge from each side so they were kind of flush, and then I sketched a rough shape onto some more placemat. This time I wanted to hot glue it. There's no good reason for this other than my impatience. I wanted the base to be a bit more interesting than just Lancashire sand, opting for some kind of floor tiles, so I pilfered Mrs Miniscape's packet of bran flakes and roughly cut out some squares. I didn't bother pre-measuring these, I just eyeballed them. Once these were stuck down with PVA, I sprinkled on some more sand to represent grit and small pieces of rubble. Once that had dried, some watered down PVA was applied to seal it all in and give a rock solid finish. I've been using this two quid tub of fix and grout for about three years now. It has many uses, but today it's to add some texture to the ruin and fill in some gaps. And there we go. That ruin is pretty much ready to paint. But let's make one more, and oh boy, this is the biggie. Yes, I'm going for the one with the extra floor, and man, am I gonna have to channel both barrels of Mike McVeigh for this one. So again, I have a paper template, but it has all sorts of arches and stuff and I don't want to settle for cardstock here, so I moulded some from Milliput instead. Thank goodness my hands have stability the UK economy could only dream of. This build also has pillars, and though I spent too long scouring eBay for decorative cake pillars, I realised I could craft them from materials I had lying around. So I took some of this 
ridged foam and wrapped it around a plastic tube, gluing it intermittently with hot glue. There were three pillars in total, all of different lengths. At this stage, I will admit I had to discard one of the pillars due to using a tube that was too wide, but sometimes that's part of the process. And experimenting during the crafting process is a source of joy for me, even if it means I have to redo a step. It's about trial and error, and problem solving, in order to expand my skill set in the long term. Failure is part of learning. Don't be afraid to fall and bounce back people. The pillar needed a top and bottom, so I used parts of a spent glue stick. I have found that glue sticks are useful items to keep for such crafting projects. I also paint the top with grout to make it look like masonry. Here's the pillar stuck to the base. The main body of the ruin was foam core, and I began sticking the parts I had made to this with super glue. These include the arches, some card for the brickwork, and some bamboo skewers for the smaller pillars. Between the pillar and arches, there was another small piece which I used by chopping up matchsticks. I repeated this gluing process until everything was in place and more or less evenly spaced out. With that panel done, I hot glued it next to the main pillar. I also attached another piece of foam core at the base, and then attached the other pillar, and then the other wall section. I repeated this process on the other side. Some grout was applied for a rougher finish, since I find foam core too smooth to begin with. And like on the previous ruin, I used some cardboard squares to give the effect of stone tiles. Again, these are PVA'd in place, and drizzled with some local sand. And before we start the painting, here's the three ruins on the turntable. The last one also has the upper floor, which I made from foam core, roughly cut to shape, and glued in position with some hot glue. They were the old mats, so I used them for crafting. Oh my gosh! What? Sorry, but how can I actually use those? You know, if you have people around for dinner, here you go, here, here you are, enjoy your meal off that. What even is that? I it's thought they were waste. Mess. I'm so sorry, I thought they were waste. Well, they are now, aren't they? You're gonna have to buy some more. Now, I didn't want to spray paint these to begin with, so I made a brush on brown primer by mixing black and red craft paint and some PVA glue. This was liberally applied everywhere with a large old brush on the base and the ruins. Later, I used a smaller but equally old brush to push the paint into the cracks. In many cases, I prefer brown as the base layer since if I miss any spots with the next, it just looks a bit grimy underneath rather than the work of an artist who doesn't know what he is doing. I mean, maybe I don't, but let's move on. And there's the base coat done. Now the next coat will be this blue-grey, which I found can be achieved by mixing blue and brown. I like how it looks not entirely unlike, in fact quite a bit like Thunderhawk Blue, which as you may know from my Black Legion paint jobs, is a great colour to highlight black armour. But here I'm just slopping it on the terrain, on most areas except those that will have a more golden finish. A wiser man than I once lauded two thin coats and thin your paints. But since I want a textured finish, there's not even the subtle scent of a paint thinner here. With the craft paint I use, thinning often reduces the opacity far too much anyway. I still use two coats during this step however. One coat, as you can see, does not give the brightness 2nd edition 40k was known for. This future may be grim. But it ain't dark. Well, maybe it's a little bit dark. The ruin with the extra floor gets more of this blue colour than the others. I love this colour so much, I think every grey stone in scenery should have a shade of blue in it personally. It just makes the piece more interesting to look at and less like a monochrome photo. I said before I wanted the paint undiluted to add texture, but to make the texture more stone-like and less like brushstroke, I dab on this sponge while the paint is wet. It's just a kitchen sponge, nothing fancy. 
On this piece, I'm brushing on another blue-grey, but this time, I used far more blue than brown in the mix. Consider this a sort of highlighting step, and when brushed perpendicular to the pillar, it highlights the ridges in a pleasing way. On the first floor, I sponge on this same blue mixture as well. On the other two pieces, I crack out this ochre to paint the brickwork, leaving the brown from the last coat showing beneath. This colour did need a few layers to get the coverage I wanted. And here's how the pieces look so far. I put a blob of dark sand on my palette and work that into the bristles of my favourite makeup brush. I use this to highlight not only the ochre brickwork but also the raised parts I painted blue. It doesn't seem the right colour to use in this case but I am pleased with the results and moreover it gives the whole piece a more weathered effect in my opinion. I use dark sand to dry brush the bases as well to pick out the raised areas. Makeup brushes make excellent dry brushes for projects like these. They are usually inexpensive too. I highly recommend them. On the inner walls of some of the pieces, I apply a sort of magnolia colour, which was all arranged for painting interiors in homes in the 90s. So why not the inner walls of these ruins too? Moreover, it looks somewhat like the plaster you might expect on the interior of a old building. Again, I sponge on highlights where appropriate and dab on some white paint with my makeup brush as well, which covers a smaller area at a time. On the base of this one, I use tan earth and paint that between the tiles. I was kind of experimenting with different browns for the bases here. I encourage you to experiment with whatever colours you have. For the tiles I placed on the base of some ruins, I painted these alternating black and white. I also use this pattern on the first floor of that special ruin, diluting some Vallejo white paint with this flow improver and using my finest brush to sketch on some lines before filling it in with white paint. This was slow and painstaking, but I'm glad I paid attention to this step. You'll notice there's another square pattern on this floor. These are roughly one centimeter square each, which I carved in with my knife. When it came to the checkerboard pattern, I painted a line roughly halfway first, then divided each new section in half, and finally a single line down the middle perpendicular to the others. This was a convenient way of eyeballing the pattern rather than mess about with rulers and the like. And there we have it. It took a while, but I think it was worth it. I wanted a flyer on each wall inside with some imperial propaganda. I know you can print them off, but I wanted to write my own. I painted each one in place with dilute PVA once the ink was dry and then stained them with some thin down brown paint. My bits box contains all manner of artificial flora, including bushes and static grass. I used PVA or super glue to fix these in place on the bases, which provides the finishing touches. And after a few days of hard graft, here are four ruins based on the old cardboard ones from the second edition starter set. Of course, there are more that I can do. There was 20 in the original set after all, but these will do for now. Even if they don't see many games, they provide a nice backdrop to my photos and videos. I know some of you commented on them when they appeared in my Chaos Terminators video. I hope I have given some of you some inspiration to try this yourself. And please don't feel shackled to my method and materials. Experiment with what you have lying around. I'm not pushing placemats necessarily. They were just what I had at the time. Much of these pieces were made from literal trash. And it feels good to upcycle materials into something beautiful. I'm pretty sure this will not be the last batch of retro terrain I make. Just don't expect a video on alien cacti. Everyone else seems to have done that already. So if you do have a go at making some ruins, then please do let me know how it goes, either through the comments, or email me, or DM me on Instagram. And with that, I had better go paint some more minis. Take care, and thanks for watching.